Welcome to Certificate Course in Dialogue Studies, Week 11, Session 2. We have with us today Lakshmi Menon Bhatia. Uh, we welcome you, ma'am, and uh, I will just introduce you. Um, Lakshmi Menon Bhatia is a result-oriented professional with proven abilities in the field of human rights, corporate social responsibility, policy development, and strategic thinking. Her key strengths include both verbal and written forms of communication. Lakshmi also ran her own radio show on spirituality and consciousness for a number of years and has guided various individuals and organizations on their journey into meditation. She's herself a seeker, striving to live by the Upanishadic uh, dictum, Ekam Sat Vipra Bahuda Vadanti, meaning there is only one truth, the wise call it by many names. She has also taken classes at various national and international universities on business and human rights, mindfulness and spiritual practices in business, etc. And she has been a facilitator of various courses in peace and dialogue studies. We are very grateful that you've taken time uh, to join us today, ma'am. And we hope um, that our students get to learn a lot uh, from you. Uh, there are just a couple of uh, admin announcements. All participants are required uh, to switch on their cameras uh, at all moments in the okay. entire session. And uh, uh, ma'am, you have two hours uh, to conduct your session. Um, there will be uh, the uh, there will be the main uh, part where you will be speaking, uh, and there will also be some question answer round. You can do that uh, later, or you can mix it up. You can conduct it however you want. So. Uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, uh, Pragya, and thank you, Bezad. Um, it feels like coming back home in a way because I think uh, I've done these sessions in the space for a few years now. And um, it's very good to see more and more people who are actually trying to figure out what peace, dialogue, and any of this means in a very, very chaotic world. Um, so thank you once again, Bezad and Pragya for this opportunity. Before I start, I would love to know, since this is not a very large group, I would love to kind of know a little bit about uh, you. So if each of you could just introduce yourselves, tell me where you're from, where you're located geographically, and uh, then we will get into the session. My session is on dialogue and conflict resolution. So I hope to keep it as a dialogue and not a monologue. So we'll keep this interactive and you're free to ask me questions. And so let's see how the next um, hour and a half to a couple of hours go. Okay, so, and I'm not the only teacher here. I learn from each of you. So it will be a two-way street. All right, so uh, Pragya, maybe you could just read the names of the participants. That'll be quicker. Otherwise, everyone kind of waits for somebody else to introduce first. So yeah, I have a nude uh, first on my seat uh, on my screen, and then Akanksha. So we start with that. Sure. Okay. Hello, ma'am. Uh, how are you, everyone? I'm Noor uh, from Iraq, northern Iraq, from Slaymania. And um, I'm uh, working uh, with Dialogue and Culture Organization. And it's so nice to see you. Great. Thank you, Noor. Thank you so much. Hello, ma'am. Uh, I'm Akansha. Currently, I'm in Mumbai. And I'm a research scholar, PhD research scholar. Okay. Great. Thank you, Akansha. Uh, Ruben, and uh, next, and then Hayward. Okay, hello, ma'am. Nice to meet you. Hi. Uh, my name is Ruben, and I am from Manipur in northeast of India, and I am currently working in the education sector. Thank you. Great. Okay. Uh, hello, uh, I am Hefar uh, from Kurdistan region in Iraq. I live in Suleimania, and I work in a dialogue and culture organization. And nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thank you, Hevar. Um, we have uh, Reshmi next and then Shra. Hello, good afternoon, ma'am. Nice to have you. Uh, I'm an academic and I hail from Assam. And I live in Bombay, but right now I'm in Delhi. Okay. And looking forward to your lecture. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Shra, uh, you can go next. Hear us. 
Okay, um, we move forward. We have Arafat. Arafat? Hello? Hello. Hi. Good afternoon. Hi. I was actually outside. Hi. My name is Arafat and I am from Kashmir. Uh, currently, I'm doing my PhD from Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Okay. Yes. What is your PhD on? I'm working on Central Asian states. Okay. Great. Yeah. Nice. Next is uh, Ayanda. Ayanda, if you can hear us. Okay, so I think uh, maybe... Uh, Shah and Ayanda can hear us. Yeah, we can continue sure. with it. All right. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start with a small exercise. I want everyone to close their eyes and just be seated. So, you know, Arafat, if you're walking around, just sit somewhere because otherwise you'll bang into something. I need you all to close your eyes and uh, do two things. One is to think of any moment in your life when you felt really, really peaceful, okay? When you have known what peace feels like, not an intellectual discussion, the feeling of peace. I just want you to experience that in this moment. Close your eyes and visualize that. And as you do that, just pay attention to how your breathing changes when you begin to visualize peace. Let's all do that. I'm doing that too. And I'll, in a few moments, open my eyes and ask you to do the same. So let's just go into that space of peace. Just pay attention to your breathing pattern as you're visualizing peace. Now take one long deep breath and slowly bring your attention back and you can open your eyes whenever you're ready. <clears throat> And whoever would like to share with us, please explain what you visualized and what you felt when you visualized it. Who would like to go first? This is a dialogue course, okay? So we need to have a dialogue. Who would like to go first? So this either means none of you have ever experienced peace, then we have a larger problem at hand. Can or, I share it? Or, which is not uh, a surprise in these times, but um, anyone, yes, anybody willing to share. Reshmi? Yeah, if no one else is sharing, I mean, I usually start speaking the first. So it I doesn't wait. matter. It doesn't matter. That's <laughs> not a... So, that's not a um, no, so uh, I would also like to quickly uh, take myself and this discussion a little um, back in my life uh, where I actually struck upon peace as a, in a very serendipitous way. Mm -hmm. So even if I wouldn't have closed my eyes, I know exactly that point of departure where uh, I suddenly felt something which within me which I never felt before. And that was when I started to uh, I took up watercolor painting last year, 2021, uh, end of May. I think my first painting I did on 18th of May. Hmm. And then by 28th of May, I had like more colors and I started to paint. There was this extraordinary time when suddenly I felt that, okay, this is the time of that I'm connecting with myself where everything else just doesn't interfere. I won't say bother, but interfere. So that deep, you know, connection that I had established while doing it is like complete travel inwards. So when I'm like right now going back to, I'm going back to the same time. Beautiful. It was not like a search, search. 
firstly and the second thing is the breathing pattern of course it slows down because you are trying to connect to that part so it slows down it has a little more of gravitas you're more conscious of the breathing i would say beautiful thank yeah. you so much as you can see um, a very important part of dialogue is to be able to listen to what the other has to say in a space of non judgment so thank you for sharing and uh, you know you're a teacher too reshmi you are sharing your experiences with us and helping us along who else would like to share anybody who has not felt peace ever in their life closing eyes itself is it you you are at at peace itself mm. and i felt like you know when my daughter was born mm. i just you know that thing stru struck my mind i was remembering when i hold my baby in my arms wow it was very peaceful that's beautiful thank you so much for sharing anybody else i'm not going to ask everybody so one last sharing of what the moment of peace felt like yeah i could share that um yes. uh, you know typically uh, when we say imagine yourself being you know at peace uh one would think of being out in the nature or you know in the in the ocean or something like that <laughs> i tried that but it didn't work for me uh for me i think i love reading so when i thought back to you know my moments of peace inevitably i come back to books and uh, imagine myself reading and so that had the peaceful and calming effect on me so i just want to share that that's great okay so what we are seeing here thank you so much everybody what we are seeing here is basically peace is happening when either we are connecting with ourselves in a deeper way which is what reshmi said okay these are all the pointers so the chaos is there around us right this is a world which is going through major changes at this point and there is a lot of chaos but in that chaos when we go deeper within and connect with something inside us we begin to feel peace and how do we know we are peaceful a it is a feeling of calm but b why did i ask you to focus on your breath whenever you are in a state of peace and i'll come to quantum physics and vibrations in a bit you will see that your breathing slows down and you breathe long and deep so very simple way of monitoring yourself throughout the day is to see is my breathing short and fast if so consciously choose a few moments where i make it long and deep why is this important on a physical level it helps to make sure your blood pressure stays normalized there is more oxygen in your body which impacts your thinking impacts your moods and emotions and when you are in that space where you're breathing consciously positive hormones are released into your blood stream which have a lot of implications okay those of us who are living in these times where we are surrounded by a lot of negativity a lot of negative media um you know strange politics economics um and you know just so much of radiation because of all the technological gadgets we are surrounded by our brain waves are usually in a very stressed out state so if any of you was to go and get an eeg done with your brain waves and i'm talking about all established scientific studies you will find that your brain is mostly functioning in what is called the beta state the beta state of brain waves is something that we need usually for activity when we are you know busy working this and that and all the rest of it what is happening now particularly in the last 10 to 15 years is even when we try to relax or lie down to sleep or go on a vacation our brain is not being able to switch from this beta to the more relaxed state of alpha and delta and theta and i'll tell you why this is important for peace studies so we are constantly in this wired state 
how many of you and just a you know lift of hands here how many of you have felt many times when you lie down to sleep your brain is just not shutting down it happens to me you know it's just there's just something going on all the time this will not allow us to harness the energy of peace without which we cannot bring resolution to any conflict around us why am i saying this if we look at the huge icons of um, peace in the past people who have made a significant difference to global history i'm going to go really back i'm going to go back 800 years to the time of saint francis of assisi and sultan bin kamal of egypt this was in the midst of the crusades and the crusades were happening for political reasons and understand this you know we feel like this is like the worst time ever we are going through so much of chaos but remember every generation in one form of the or the other needs to go through huge crisis to actually as a generation discover the way out of it so right now you know we have political disturbances we have pandemics we have wars god knows what else happening now people say we are going to go into a recession for the next decade so help us god it is what it is but if you look at prior generations they have been world wars they have been famines they have been you know droughts there have been so many things so 800 years ago was the time when there were these big crusades happening in europe and in the middle east and in turkey and for a variety of reasons and in that two people two people um and if you can get hold of a documentary film called the sultan and the saint please watch it this is the story of saint francis of assisi and sultan bin kamal of egypt what happens is in the midst of this there is a serendipitous since reshma used that word meeting between two men of peace of different faiths but when they come together saint francis learns from the sultan what the power of prayer is he sees the way muslims pray with so much of faith five times a day he hears about the 99 names of allah correct me if i'm wrong it's 99 i hope um so he hears all of that and it touches and moves him deeply and then there is an interaction with the sultan who's also a man of peace and the coming together of these two individuals who held the vibration of peace changes the course of history and the crusades begin to decline this is how powerful you and i are one individual who's able to anchor the energy of peace strongly within can change the course of history and in more contemporary times when we look at nelson mandela we look at tiknath han we look at martin luther king mahatma gandhi and there are so many other unsung heroes who in their own ways have held together peace in conflict zones in the times of disaster in the times of great changes you realize what makes these people extraordinary is that they went inwards first they found that place within them which was the vibration the frequency of peace and then they came out from there and offered themselves and their services to the world when mahatma gandhi said be the change you wish to see this is what he meant you want peace you have to become peace you want conflict resolution you have to work on your own inner conflicts first work on resolving them what you become then is a power house a power house whose mere presence in a situation or in a place can shift things so this is why i wanted you to have an experience of what peace is about especially in these times of great chaos and change um it was martin luther king who said our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter 
and so linked with this inner connection is the understanding that each of us has a voice, each of us has a purpose, each of us has a mission. We are not randomly born on this planet. We are all here with a purpose. And if we continue to turn inwards to fine tune what that purpose is, we will be connected with our tribe, with our soul tribe, other people like us all over the world with whom when we connect, there is a quantum increase in the field of peace that we want to create. This is how the network begins to build. But it all starts with you and it all starts with I. The field of peace, as per the quantum scientists, when they measure the brains of people who are involved in conflict resolution, in doing peace work, in doing more positive work for the society, people who meditate or people who are yogis and saints and practitioners of faith and peace, they find that their brain is wired in a very different way. They're mainly in the alpha brainwave state or in delta or theta. Now, Albert Einstein, who I believe was a great mystic, you see, Einstein was a dyslexic. He used to flunk mathematics. And as we know, he's known to be one of the most famous modern scientists. But Einstein is the first himself to admit that, you know, it used to be when he was sitting in the Alps in Austria and just soaking in the beauty of Mother Nature, he would feel that his mind expanded and there was no him. There was no him. His entire mind expanded where his own personality boundaries kind of dissolved. And in that state, he used to say that formula, formulae, theorems and all of these things used to stream into his consciousness from somewhere. Which again means that if you go into a space of deep relaxation, despite what is happening around you, you begin to have access to better problem solving, to more innovative ways of thinking of the same situation and looking at new solutions. All of these mechanisms that I'm sharing with you are things which I hope will help you understand just how much of power you have as an individual. Because many times when I take these classes and sessions, people say, but what can I do? What can I do in a, you know, in a conflict, in a war? What can I do when the policies and politics are such? What can I do when the economics is only, you know, made to suit a few people? What can I do when women have no voice and power? You can do everything because within you is that source, that nuclear force. You just have to know how to connect with it. And when you do, everything begins to change. That is the quantum shift. Years ago, there was about 100 years ago, there was a scientist called Nikola Tesla. And uh, Tesla used to talk about... Um, um, this field, this quantum field, this power, this energy, which is accessible to us at all times. In fact, he went on to say that free energy is not a myth. Free energy is available in the quantum field. And he had certain ways it could be actually used so that power would become free for everybody. But then we know there are other lobbies which still want the oil and gas and this and that. And the politics and of power and money, which is what sort of keeps this, this human species enslaved. But he used to say, tap into that power. Tap into that power and you begin to see what is possible. Uh, Reshmi talked about how when she started to paint or Ruben talked about when he reads, there is this, there is this place of peace or when somebody is holding their baby, um, there is this feeling of love and peace. Now see, this feeling, um, does it happen in the mind or does it happen in the heart? And I'll tell you why I want to take you into the heart space. It's really, really important. Um, any of these feelings which are to do with the finer emotions will happen in the heart. And scientists now say, 
uh, in about 20 odd years ago in Stanford, um, there was a center that was incubated called the Heart Math, M-A-T-H, like mathematics, Heart Math Institute. You can note it down and you can Google and search the Heart Math Institute. The Heart Math Institute has been studying the power of the human heart. And they've come out saying that the field of the human heart is 5,000 times more powerful than that of the mind, which is a dualistic mind. You know that if you have studied biology, you know that there is a right and a left lobe and both these centers function differently. One is more creative, one is more logical, rational and so on. But the heart is different. It's a unified field and it's 5,000 times stronger. Now, some very interesting experiments happened. All of this is building up. You know, you're wondering if any of you is wondering how is this connected with conflict resolution? You need to understand who you are first and what you have access to so that you don't feel helpless going into the battlefield in whatever forms you need to. So NASA has satellites which keep circling the earth, as we all know. Now other countries also have that. So, and there are charts which basically study the Earth's atmospheric field, okay? Their general reading, it's just like the heartbeat, you know, so they kind of, it studies the atmosphere of the Earth. And suddenly the scientists saw that there were certain time periods when there were all kinds of crazy spikes in the satellite readings. Then they tried to correlate what was happening at that time when these crazy spikes happened. So, um, one of the spikes happened when the second plane hit the Twin Tower, between the first and the second plane hitting the Twin Tower, 9-11. There was this huge spike in the Earth's radiation field, okay? Then they saw that when Princess Diana died, that was another day where there were huge spikes in the Earth's radiation field. Then they saw when the FIFA World Cup final happens, there's a very different kind of spike. Or say if there is a cricket World Cup final and, for example, a country like India with so much of population wins, there's again another spike. And then they started to understand, oh my God, this means the human emotion is so potent and strong, it can actually shift the Earth's atmospheric field. Think about this. Think about this. So when there is a focus on human tragedy, there is a particular impact. When there is a focus on celebrations and joy, there is another kind of impact. Now I want to connect this with another scientific study. There was a very famous scientist in Japan called Masaru Emoto. And writers named on Masaru Emoto, he accidentally stumbled across. He used to be a technician for the water board in Japan, I think in Tokyo, wherever he was. And one day he just tried an experiment where he took a sample of the municipal water and he uh, wrote under, he took three different samples, under one glass jar bottle in which the water was, he wrote the word love in Japanese. In one, he wrote hate. And in one, he wrote nothing. And he froze these three samples of water. And then he studied its crystal for, uh, formation under the electron microscope. He was shocked with what we, he saw. The water crystals where love was written was beautiful like snowflakes, the most perfect formation. The, word, the one with the hate, the word hate written had distorted dark aberrations in its uh, formation. And the neutral one was the regular water crystals. Then he started to experiment with words in different languages. The same thing happened. And he began to understand, oh my God, water has its own intelligence. How does it understand this? Then later on, they took the study to another level without even writing the words. He would just send thoughts out. I think the books, there are a couple of books. It's called The Hidden World of Water or something. If you just Google Masaru Emoto, you'll get it and you'll get the pictures of these snowflakes. They would just transmit thoughts, positive thoughts, negative thoughts and neutral thoughts. 
the same thing happened. Now I want you to think of the implications of this. Our human body is more than 70% water. When we send out anger, angry thoughts, hatred out into the field, think of the impact A, it has on our own body and what it has on the people outside. And when we become a very angry civilization, because constantly we are being fed about everything that's going wrong with the world. If you, you know, I've stopped listening or reading mainstream media. I go through, I still love newspapers, so I'll just scan the headlines and then I kind of keep it because I don't want to absorb negative energy and spoil all the water crystals in my own body. But I need to be informed. The fact is when there is this interface and interchange of negativity on such a global scale because of technology. See, the best thing about technology is it amplifies anything. It can amplify love, it can amplify violence, and it does. There are serious implications. This is the field in which we are operating in our own spaces without understanding what is really going on and what is the difference we can make. If you look at any of the great beings who have created positive change in a big way, they will always tell you, you have to go inwards first. So for 15 years of my life, I used to work for a US corporation. I work for a company called Gap, which makes clothes. Gap, Old Navy, Banana Republic, these were the brands we used to own. And I was in the field of business and human rights. I used to look after the issues of ethical supply chains and so on. And I was usually the person who was sent into major conflict zones. So for example, if there's a factory collapse in Bangladesh or if a trade union leader has been kidnapped in Cambodia or you know, there's a factory lockout in Turkey, um, I would be one of the people sent in to help negotiate and so on. Um, I traveled a lot. So I've been to more than 30 countries and for 10 years I lived out of a suitcase. The one thing that I learned through all of this work is that we have more in common with each other as human beings than we have differences. The human condition, the human emotions are far more similar than the differences. But guess what happens if we continue to highlight only the differences, then that is the kind of fracture which grows in this world. Because you see, I said we are very powerful magnetic beings. I repeat that we are very powerful magnetic beings. What do I mean by magnetic beings? We are made out of atoms and molecules, each of which has its own magnetic field. This is what makes up our human body. We have thoughts, brains, neural networks, which has its own electric field. We have a heart, which has its own magnetic field. So we are magnetic beings and what we continue to send out is what we will continue to attract. This is, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of interest in the law of attraction over the last decade and a half. And this is what it's all about. So coming back to this, when you find yourself in situations of conflict, the first thing you have to ask yourself is, who is it I need to become to be able to find a way through this, to find a way forward? This does not mean you become silent. This does not mean that you stop your activism. It doesn't mean any of these things. It just become, means that you become more conscious, more aware, when you're holding this field inside you of what is the energy you want to bring into any situation. And when you come from that, you will see the kind of solutions that happen. So there's one particular case I want to share with you. When I was in Bangladesh, um, there was a spectrum factory collapse in 2005 and 67 workers died, more than 84 were injured. And it was a very, very sad situation. And so we brought together a delegation of the brands and retailers who were buying from there. And we went in along with trade unions and NGOs and uh, the media. We went in to 
uh, try and see what is the kind of solution that the country needs. The garment industry in Bangladesh is the number one industry. So it's pretty important even from a economic perspective. And when we went in there, the usual rhetoric was, you know, the industry was blaming the government, was blaming the brands and retailers, was blaming the workers, was blaming, everybody was blaming the other. How familiar does this situation sound? Usually in any conflict situation, you'll see everyone is pointing fingers at the others. Then through some intense work, we managed to put together a multi-stakeholder platform where we said, you know, we hear you, we hear you, we hear you, we hear all of you, but let's come together and let's see if there is a common meeting ground. Because we agree that all of you truly care about the industry in this country. And we also assume that you care about the workers who are dependent on this for their survival. So let's come together and see what is possible. The coming together often opens up very, very interesting possibilities. So as peace practitioners, no matter where you are, one of these strategies you should always try and think, and don't do this um, without thinking it through. Try and see how can I look at bringing people together and creating an atmosphere in which we listen to each other without judgment. Uh, we did a very interesting exercise in GAP. Um, you know, there used to be a lot of issues. Um, GAP never owned any of the factories, but we used to source or buy from many, many countries. So what used to happen is whenever there were like worker disputes in any of the factories, the trade union leaders would, you know, send a letter about the management in the factories being this, that and the other and firing workers illegally and so on. And the management would send their version and all of this used to happen. And then the people within GAP who used to go to audit factories, they used to struggle with what is the real truth. We said, let's try and connect them. So we brought in the compliance team, the social compliance or the social audit teams from GAP, as well as the labor representatives from each of the countries. And we said, let's have an informal dinner. And we made them sit next to each other. So the GAP person from Cambodia and the labor person from Cambodia sat together, from India sat together, from Pakistan sat together, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> good food, good ambience. Half an hour into this, suddenly we see they're exchanging their children's photographs. They're finding common friends. Some of them went to the same school or college and they're connecting as people first. You cannot imagine 90% of the letters we used to get filled with anger and blame from the countries practically stopped overnight because they began to connect as human beings first and started to talk to each other and realized, oh, even if there's an issue, let's try and find solutions together first. And if not, we can escalate it. So this human to human contact is so critical when we look at conflict resolution. Why am I highlighting this point? In a world which is increasingly virtual, I would have loved to sit in one room with each of you. Because while I see their, your beautiful faces, I know if we sat together, there would be so much more of your energy I would be picking up. And you know what they say when we come together, each of us will leave with a small piece or part of the other. That's what happens when we come together, when we really sit together. So in an increasingly virtual world, uh, all we see are these small thumbnails or sometimes just the names. How can we connect, really connect? And if you want resolution of any conflict, you have to connect at the deepest level because everybody has their pain. Everybody has their own point of view. Nobody's wrong. That is their experience. So if you've been somebody who has grown up in a war zone, your reality is that. That is what has shaped your experience. I can't sit here in Delhi and say, oh, you have no right to feel that way, but there's so many good things in the world. This is your experience. I have to, with compassion, listen to your experience, 
hold your pain and then share what I have to. For all of this, that human to human contact has to be brought back. So one recommendation I have to each of you, do this safely, please, but whenever you can, get out in your respective countries of your travel, connect with locals, don't go off on your own, connect with locals you can trust and go and meet people. The people to people contact is really what builds the peace networks. It's not political conferences. It is not huge, you know, seminars and all of those have a part to play. But if that could have changed the world, I think all of these United Nations gatherings should have done that. But what we see is an increasingly fractured world. The only thing that will change it is the people to people contact. Because when I sit with you, I hear about your story. I hear about your conflicts. I hear about your pain. I get moved as a human being. You're no longer just a data or a number or a nationality to me. You're an actual human being. So how do we bring the human being back into the center of all our dialogues is going to be important. This is kind of counterintuitive to the direction in which the world is being forced to move, which is all about big data, artificial intelligence, more virtual platforms, you know, robotics, all of these things which desensitize and limit the human contact. This is when each of you will be called to really go out and bring the human back into the human experience. So I want to pause here and take any questions or comments or sharings before I move on to the next segment. Anything at all? <clears throat> any thoughts, any questions, any sharings? Is this making sense or is this like, why is she talking about physics to us? Give me some feedback, others. Beza, this is I I want to share a couple of things, maybe Please. also reflect. Um, <clears throat> firstly, I want to say that what a marvelous voice you have is it is so calming to hear you. And uh, I don't know, maybe it is your years of experience and also maybe a deeper connection which you have established with yourself that what you're speaking reaches to us directly. I don't know about others, but I think a lot of ways which where I can see their uh, face, I think um, you're a healer. So any which way, that's not, not the thing. The question that I wanted to actually ask is that when you were talking about commonality, you know, people coming together uh, from the position of conflict and share something which is so fundamental to us, having food together or sharing food or sharing water, the most fundamental things that enable the life to progress, the life to survive and sustain. So in that context, I want to ask that however much you finish that sentence by saying that I wish I was in the same room as you people so that I could absorb your energy and also understand your pain. I want to know why did you use pain instead of happiness? Why didn't you use joy? Why didn't you use, um, you know, a, 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 a moment of spark, you know, moment of marvel? But you use the word pain. And uh, so there's this other uh, friend of mine who uh, is a psychoanalyst. And we were discussing that. I mean, I just want to give a backdrop before sure. uh, so leaving the question for you is that, um, so we were discussing that, you know, pain is so innate that we naturally connect to it. So with everything, when the mother is big, um, giving birth to a child, she's undergoing labor. She has to undergo pain. So anything which has to sprout and mushroom, anything which has to see the light of the day, you know, and pro progress as a life, as in, you know, take birth as a life, whatever it could be it could be emotions it could be love it could be a childbirth or anything a sapling it has to undergo rupture so i want to ask you that is the energy always driven by pain and then how then why are we seeking joy like you know that's the thing right like we are saying that happiness doesn't come to us naturally 
Sure. So we are thinking, oh, what is this? What, what are we striving for in life? We are striving for absolute happiness. We are not saying we are wanting absolute pain, right? But then which means that the fundamental, um, Starting point. I mean, not fundamental, but the, but the default mode is pain. The default, default mode is uh, sorrow or you know, agony. Beautiful, is beautiful question, Reshmi. I mean, really, and, you know, it just shows your depth of uh, thinking and feeling because you wouldn't ask this if there wasn't a feeling element. And that's the other thing. You know, the thinking has to be matched with the feeling. Very, very important. Um, why pain? I'll tell you. When we talk about conflict, if I can't sit with you, and hold the space for you to feel the trauma and the pain that you have been through, anything that I talk about joy and happiness will make no sense to you. It's only when you're able to feel heard and understood. See, the human experience on this planet is a dualistic one. So there is night and day, there is life and death, you know, there are you know, there's a full moon and new moon. Similarly, there is happiness and pain. Um, fortunately, unfortunately, these are cycles. We are currently in a cycle of time where there is a lot of churning. The good news is the, the wise ones who can see and who know say that after this pain, something new will be born, Reshmi, like you said, out of this, you know, uh, there's a beautiful quote which says that crisis precedes transformation. And this is definitely a world in crisis which also means we have all of those possibilities that come. But how do we harness that possibilities without collapsing into our pain and despondency? It is by opening up the space and supporting each other. When we feel we are alone, we are isolated, our issues are not important to anybody, how can we ever feel joy? How can we ever feel support? We cannot. And, you know, throughout history, there are places, there are cultures, there are certain groups of people who have had a lot of trauma in their history, in their consciousness. And we carry this trauma in our DNA. So till there is an acknowledgement of that. But when we acknowledge that, so, you know, you, you use the word healer. I've gone through my dark nights of the soul and there have been many reshmi so if i have come out with anything which is a little bit more uh, uh, real today which i'm sharing with you it's come out of my own experience because i know firsthand what pain and trauma is but i also know if we allow that to be our only narrative and story we limit ourselves and stop ourselves from experiencing the birth of that joy, that new dawn, and so on. But for me, whenever I've been in that dark night of the soul, it has been individuals or, you know, um, sometimes pieces of music or a book or something which, or nature, which comes and holds me while I am acknowledging and releasing my pain. And that is what has helped me move forward. One of the challenges in today's world is there is so much of othering, you know. Everything is the other's fault. The other country, the other caste, the other nature, you know, nation, the other religion. In a time of othering, how can we? And I feel, um, and I'm being very honest about this, whenever Bezad brings a group of people together, I truly believe, and I'm saying this from a deep sense of, understanding, acknowledgement, and humility. I truly believe the group that comes into the space is not random. Each of you has been chosen by um, the consciousness to play a very significant role at this time. You're coming together and the roles each of you will be playing is going to have a ripple effect wherever you are. And so, which is why the first support group, if I can call it, once you're done with your courses and so on. And again, I will sort of suggest this to um, Bezad and to Pragya is to make sure that there is a small group, whether this is WhatsApp or email or whatever, a group in which all of you continue to stay you know, connected and some of us can come in as and when required from where we try to see how do we support each other? How do we first 
build our own space of peace and then as a group how do we support each other going out into the world so one of the things to do in terms of practical steps is uh, make sure you stay connected with each other make sure you bring in others who you know would love to be connected to a space like this in today's day platforms of peace and dialogue are shrinking again martin luther king um i'm paraphrasing i don't remember the exact words but he said something to the effect the day that the people of peace organize themselves as well as the people of war there will be peace on earth those of us who are peacemakers are not organized enough those of us who are war mongers you bet we are organized we have the money we have the arms we have the media we have the rhetoric and we create have up but we have to come together as peace builders peacemakers and continue to expand our network those of you who are writers i would advise you in your own way to write blogs on these issues your own experiences dealing with challenges and conflicts and how you have overcome them or stories of your friends others in this group make sure the voice gets out in a way that is safe for you i know some of you come from countries and environments where it's not always safe to speak your truth but you can do it with poetry you can you know you can use the rumis and you can use the kalil gibrans and you can use beautiful poetry to say what you want to say what is the role of poetry vis-a-vis -vis po prose in creating a greater platform for justice if you look if i go back to india for example you know when india was fighting for its independence there were great songs uh, you know from various great beings like rabindranath tagore and you know subhash chandra bose and others uh, shri aurobindo great songs and poetry which came to continue to inspire people so if there are any poets in this group this is a time for you to write from your heart so all of these things begin to have a ripple effect what we send out and we what we send out consciously begins to grow it takes on a life of its own and when you set a spark to the right flame it will become a fire and it will transform this world each of you is here for that reason nothing smaller and less than that so thank I, you for your uh, comment and question reshmi anybody else any other thoughts comments yeah i just wanted to a uh, chip in and mention that we do have an alumni network and uh, uh, alia khan as our uh, alumni coordinator so after each batch um, passes out we have a uh, i mean apart from having the continuation of the whatsapp group where we have uh, we also have uh, we meet monthly and okay. we discuss uh, and it's kind of an open forum uh, like uh, people do come up with their own um, like participants come up with their own ideas uh, their own workshops or we discuss some article or like you said poetry or, or it's 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 just generally this open space and we kind of discuss on uh, what are the things we could do together or so we 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 do stay connected and and the response is quite good as well that's really good to know pragya and i would say more power to you and all of you as you do this uh, the other thing to lift vibrations this again goes back to something reshmi um said is you know through this forum if you're able to spread positive stories of change and peace it uplifts the human experience because usually we are consciously you know when it is easiest to control people it's easiest to control people when they are in a space of fear and feel disconnected from each other and guess what is the usual mainstream methodology that is used every day we are fed horror stories of everything that's going wrong every day we are made to feel you can't trust this person that person this caste this religion this is what it's it's deliberate this is not accidental because people know that if everyone comes together they cannot be controlled and manipulated so what do we need to do as organizers of peace we have to consciously put the positive stories out we have to consciously populate the net with as many positive experiences 
as we can. So Pragya, back to your alumni network. So if one of the ideas you can take from today's discussion is how each of you can become um, champions of spreading the positive energy around. And these can be actual little bit of, you know, case studies on resolutions across the world and how difficult conflict situations have been resolved. There are so many stories. Some of you will know them personally. Some of you will do it, know it through a bit of research. Spread the word out, spread the word out. Use quotes, quotes from great people. I use quotes all the time because if something hits me and stays in my mind and inspires me, I feel that maybe it will touch at least another couple of, you know, hearts and minds. So do all of that. Raise the raise the vibe, raise the vibe across everywhere. Second thing I want to say is, you know, when we do work around peace and any kind of conflict resolution, sometimes it can be a very lonely path. Um, there might be very few, a lot of people can be very skeptical, you know, I'm mad, nothing's going to change. By the way, the biggest pandemic we have right now on the planet is the pandemic of skepticism. You know, you bring something which is positive and hopeful, there'll be 10 people who will tell you why it's not going to work. And this is a problem because what it does then to us is it makes us doubt ourselves, our own thinking, but always know the ones who have made change happen, they would have had 5,000 people telling them it's never going to work, but they have such strong courage of conviction because it comes from their own inner conviction and connection that it doesn't matter how many naysayers and skeptics are there, they will continue to spread the light. So remember this, this can be a lonely path, but that's when you need to reach out and ask for support. Personally, I want to share from my, you know, decades of experience working in different conflict zones. If I didn't have people I could reach out to for support, when I would feel sometimes miserable because some of the human situations that you know you come across um, especially if you're a sensitive individual it moves you deeply so reach out to seek the help you need so just kind of you know uh, recapping some of the points so far one is make sure you connect with yourselves every single day with that place of peace within you so that your own field of peace begins to build up secondly you know form your communities of peace. I love to call them circles of peace or circles of compassion. Because one thing, if you really understand about peace building, peace and compassion cannot be separated. So people who work towards peace are also people who have that compassion for the suffering of another. So build these circles of peace and compassion wherever you are. Include more people, even if it's an activity you do once a month, whichever country you are in, invite a few people to join in. So I have a small prayer group. It's called Rabate Salam, which is an interfaith group, which we started about three years ago. Uh, we have some um, Jesuit priests from uh, Christianity. We have some um, Sufis who join in, who are also peace builders. You know, we have some Buddhists and we have some of us, you know, Hindus and others. It, you know, the religion doesn't matter. What is important is we believe that when we come together and we pray together, something begins to change. So you don't have to be religious, religious to do that. I'll tell you what we do. We converge once a month and each time we will pick up a reading from either a book or a scripture or some passage of peace and inspiration. And we circulate that beforehand and everybody reads that and we come together and we first meditate for 15, 20 minutes on the passage in silence. And then we share with each other. And by the end of it, the whole thing is only about, you know, um, uh, an hour, hour and a half, the entire engagement. Um, something would have shifted internally. We have experiences every single time. So you can set up small, such practical circles of compassion. Um, you can discuss anything. It doesn't have to be only a religious scripture or a book. It could be some current issue which is bothering you, some conflict which is paining you. Get people to open up and talk and to build their own understanding. So this is another thing that you can do. The third thing what I said is spread the good news, you know, through your voices, through your music, through your writings. Spread the good news. 
help people understand that all is not lost on this planet. The next point is go and have that direct human experience, connect with people physically as many times as you can. So the people to people connect as many times, wherever possible, continue to build that actual exchange. The last bit is seek help and support whenever you need it. None of us are perfect. We are all on a journey. And when we reach out and seek support, there is so much of learning we do from the other. And also opening up to ask is also a very humbling experience for our own ego. When you have to ask someone for help, you have to put yourself a little down. And humility has been the signpost of these great souls who have made so much of change, whether it's Gandhiji, Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela's only fear when he was in the jail was, I don't ever want to hate the person, who, the jailer who tortured me. This was his greatest fear. Can you believe it? Think of the consciousness of this, this being. And that was not the man who went into the jail, by the way. Something happened to him in those 27, 23 or 27 years in the prison, which shifted him. So these are some pointers. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? Okay, so I want to now ask you, any of you, to share any real life experience you've had of a conflict which you have been able to solve in your own way. And alternatively, if there is something that you're struggling with but would like to share with us, and let's see how we can, you know, sort of learn from that. Anybody? Hello, ma'am. Yeah. Hello. Uh, am, I, am I audible? Yes, uh, Akansha, you are. Okay. So I don't know how much worth is this question, but uh, it's in conflict with my mind. So as you already said, we have to connect with ourselves while being in the peace. But we are becoming, you know, a pro of faking peace. Like we fake we are in a stage of peace. Like or our family fake that we are in a constantly going in a peace, state of peace. So how to come over that? Like, I, I, I'm not uh, pretty sure about uh, to connect ourselves while maintaining the state of peace. Whether that is the real peace we are experiencing or we just, you know, the social uh, media kind of taking a selfie and posting on a, we are in a nature lover or we are doing this and that. So that, that, that makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Great questions, if I've understood this correctly. Okay, let me first tell you. The problem with social media is people project out things which are far better than what reality is. And let me tell you something. Everything we put out has its natural frequency. If that is not authentic, it's not going to last. So I'm not talking about a fake state of peace or anything else, which is why when you begin to connect with yourself, those of you who have gone consciously inwards will realize that initially a lot of pain, a lot of muck can come out. A lot of things you've not wanted to deal with because part of the way the mind functions or copes is by actually keeping ourselves distracted with the external so that we don't have to go inside deep enough to be able to face our own unhealed trauma, shadows and pain. So when you begin to consciously connect with that place of peace, don't get disturbed if what begins to come out is nothing close to peace. But that's a very big part of your own inner healing. You have to allow all of those things to come and continue to seek the guidance and the help that you need for that. And so when you're able to sit with that, you begin to become more authentic. It doesn't matter if the world around you has fake social media accounts with everything which is very beautiful in this world, or if your own family says something and does something else, those things don't matter. What I'm talking about is each of our own personal journey. It's only our personal commitment which we have to focus on. That I will do the inner work that is required to find that place within me because there is a place in everyone 
which is the spark of the divine or a place of peace, it's there inside each of us. But it's usually covered by so many layers and walls of conditioning, noises from outside that we don't hear our own inner voice. So that is the journey I'm talking about. And for that, you have to have some silence every day in your 24 hours where you're not doing something, you're just happy being. And one of the easiest ways to do that is if you have any access to nature, if you go into nature, you will find that somewhere your thoughts begin to settle down and something deeper opens up. That is the magic of nature. It doesn't happen in these cement and concrete jungles that we tend to live in nowadays. But seek nature out and you'll find your answers. I, I just I just love nature and uh, I'm very happy. Like in JNU, I got the nature like everywhere. Yes. In, in IIT Mumbai. Yeah. Here in Dude. IIT Mumbai, I also got Still, I have a lot of plants in my room. So I just feel, you know, every time that. And I'm also working in this field of environmental ethics. So that also, that's why I ask you the faking piece. Like people, people are there out and they just go in the nature and fake like in the stage of that. But that's not really happening. So no, that's, that's not what this is about. You see, uh, conflict resolution comes with a lot of responsibility and deep personal integrity. I cannot be thinking one thing, saying something else and doing something else. There is a term in Sanskrit called Trikarna Shuddhi. Trikarna Shuddhi, Shuddhi means purification. Trikarna means the three aspects, which means the concept of Trikarna Shuddhi means my thoughts, words and actions are in complete alignment. So I'm not thinking something, saying something else. Most of the world will be thinking one thing, will be saying something to you, and then will go and do something completely different. That's a fractured, that is a fractured consciousness. A consciousness which is aligned. They may not agree with you, it doesn't matter, but what they think and believe and speak is also what they will do. So that alignment is important. Uh, and one, thank you thank you so much for bringing that up and I'm going to ask more of you to share uh, one of the things that we must remember when we're doing this work is um, uh, many times you'll come across people who are holding on to more pain than you are okay and um, you know I'm, I'm trained as a psychologist so part of you know what I bring into this space is is also kind of my working with people in in as a therapist so there are so many issues human beings are complex um, but there's a very um, famous saying which I used to hear a lot when I was a student of psychology which said hurt people hurt people and the flip of that is healed people heal people so when you know that if people are hurting others somewhere there is that stored pain. There is a lot of hurt within them in most cases. And in some cases, you know, they're just sort of conditioned to act in a particular way. But in most cases, by and large, it is people who are hurt who will go out and hurt others. So then that takes us to how do we change the human experience? How do we make this better? I will say, start with yourself. Start with your immediate family if you can. Sometimes family members are the most difficult to try and shift and change. But if you're holding a place of love and peace and you constantly, without a word, okay, and I've, I've used this, this is a technique I have used and it works. What I do is, especially people who really bother me and disturb me and can disrupt my happiness, whether it's my family, friends or others in the world of work and so on. I first connect with that place of peace within me and then I just take a few long deep breaths and then I actually radiate waves, radiate waves of that peace to these individuals and I send out a message telepathically saying, I hope you heal from your pain. I hope you find that place in you which is peace and love. I hope you know I forgive you for whatever it is you have done for me. Um, sometimes I visualize certain colors of these vibes that I send out like green. Green is the color of healing. So I'll send out a lot of green light from my heart 
to their heart. This is not mumbo jumbo, by the way, uh, because I'm a practitioner of yoga. In yoga, uh, the heart, there are different energy centers in our bodies called chakras. Uh, and the heart chakra, the color is emerald green. So it's an accident, not really that I'm wearing green today. I just happen, I'm in my in-law's house, but green is what I carried. So I guess that's also appropriate. So I just send waves of this emerald green light to those people who have hurt me the most. And I've really seen over a period of time, something in them begins to change. I do this quietly because when you try to go and talk to people sometimes and try to change them, their ego is hooking with your ego. And if there is a past there, it's not going to go anywhere. So even, you know, sometimes, I mean, since we are sort of speaking as friends here, you may have past relationships which are very painful, which are not fully healed. Send a lot of positive vibes into that space because so that you're free, you're free of the pain and trauma that those relationships brought. As you begin to engage like this with your entire being, including your energy, body, you will begin to see remarkable changes. Um, some of the changes you can see, this is from my own experience, is people will begin to seek you out. And they will tell you that, you know, when I'm in your presence, I just feel so peaceful. You don't have to do anything. And these would be some of the people who would sort of see you and turn the other way. But now they will seek you out. Some of them will come with their problems. Help me find a solution. You will find certain opportunities opening up for you automatically which will allow you to perform the work you are here to do you will find yourself connecting with others like i said i love the term soul tribe it's not my tri term it's something which is used in other circles but you will connect with other members of your soul tribe and you will feel that energy support uh, mary robinson i don't know how many of you have heard of her she was um, a president of ireland and a wonderful lady who's done a lot of work with Nelson Mandela and uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu and others for peace building. Uh, Richard Branson of Virgin um, uh, Atlantic, he had set up a group called the Elders. It also had uh, Ila Bhatt, uh, a lady from India who set up one of the largest um, NGOs, trade unions called Seva of about 2 million women members. So she oh, just yeah. passed away. Yes, from Gujarat. She just passed away a few, um, you know, well, a couple of weeks back. So, Ila Ben, Nelson Mandela, Desmond Tutu, Mary Robinson, they were all a part of it. And I was very fortunate to do some work with Mary when I was in Gap. And every time I met her, this is my memory of Mary Robinson. I would just feel, oh, and the Dalai Lama, I would just feel that I'm in a field of love. It's just, there was something in this person um, that just meant the field of love. I was also very fortunate once to fly with His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, to London. So it's a nine-hour flight. I was sitting three seats behind him. And I can't explain to you, for me, what it meant as somebody who does meditation, kind of, sort of, uh, you know, since a number of years, when I entered the flight, actually, before I entered the flight, when I was in the airport, I began to feel as if I was in some very powerful space. And I enter the flight and I see His Holiness saying Namaste. And I thought, oh, my God, this is important. And I sat there for those nine hours. And literally, I was having spontaneous experiences within me, which I can't explain with my logical mind. That is how powerful this field is that they hold. Why I'm sharing this with you, it's not exclusive to Mary Robinson or the Dalai Lama. This is the potential you and I have if we are able to go deeper within. Any other thoughts, any other comments, any other questions? We have to keep this as a dialogue. Any other real life situations? Yes, ma'am, in the car in yellow. Good to see you. Mona Lisa, yes, nice name. Yeah, you have her smile for sure. I can't hear you though. I think she's on mute. Oh, yeah. Thank yes. you. Uh, firstly, thank you so much. I I feel very in sync. I feel very in sync with what you're saying. 
uh, because I have started my journey of spiritual journey with sound healing, vibration, um, NLP, uh, and all the healings that I could, you know, venture into. And the first breakthrough that I had was uh, I fell in love with myself. Wow. And it was so beautiful. And I can, there is no logical way in which we can explain, but I can, I can feel you when you're saying that. And um, that is one of the reasons that I work with women and children to, uh, to be able to give them the opportunity to see this kind of um, transformation which happens just like that. So I'm so sorry, I'm, I have to drive for my mom and get some medications and all. So I am in the car, but I am like Reshmi, I'm the one who's popping and you know responding immediately. And we're always excited. Thank you so much. It was so beautiful. And I, um, I love you. Uh, and this is so amazing. I would love to uh, connect you and you know, take this forward and learn something, you know, small little bits from you. That would be a grand uh, blessing. Thank you so much. Oh, no. Thank you, Mona Lisa. Where are you based? I'm based in Bhuvaneshwar, the temple city. <laughs> Lovely. Yes, I've been there. Beautiful city. So firstly, thank you for sharing. And you brought up such an important thing. You see, self-love, especially in these times, is one of the most difficult things. If you fully accept yourself, if you fully love yourself, the good, bad and the ugly within you, your ability to accept the world around you becomes so much better. Sometimes, unfortunately, uh, you know, especially in our countries where there's a lot of this modern education that has come over the last few decades, you know, we are, we are shamed, we are made to feel inadequate if we don't perform as per some indicator. Somebody has decided that you're stupid, you're not intelligent enough if you don't get some marks or if you don't do this, if you don't do... And all of this, especially when we are children, and I'm going to come to the children parenting bit in a moment, it gets deeply embedded and wounds our inner child. And then the rest of our life, we are struggling with this paradigm that our inner child holds and it will keep popping up whenever there is a stress situation. So the healing of this inner child is what Mona Lisa is talking about. And when that happens, I have to say, I feel you, Mona Lisa. I can... I can see the energy you're exuding and I'm sure wherever you go, people will come to you. You are a kind of a magnet. People will be drawn towards you, your openness, your smile. If this happens. This is natural. Uh, that reminds me of another thing. Do you know that in these days of smartphones, do you know how little eye contact we make with each other? Looking into each other's eyes is the best way of connecting with somebody's soul. Now you see, even a family, okay? Four people go to a restaurant, everybody's sitting with their own individual phones. There is no eye contact. We get into an elevator, nobody is looking around. This is why we feel disconnected. And guess what? Disconnection is the start of depression, anxiety, panic, and everything else that comes from this space of isolation. Because we are going against our inherent nature. So another activity for everybody, start making eye contact. Now, um, you know, please be conscious from a gender standpoint if you're in certain cultures or countries. If I mean, if I suddenly start staring into the eyes of every man, you know, people will probably misunderstand. But um, if you're opening your heart, having a smile like Mona Lisa, then no one's going to misunderstand you. So just use that with discretion, but do that. Secondly, for those of you who are parents or would be parents or have young nieces, nephews, neighbors around. Children are going through a lot of conflict in these times because the parents are so conflicted between the old values and what are the new pressures in the world around? What does success look like? 
how do I need to be a social media influencer? How do I need to have 2.5 million followers on Twitter or this? I mean, it's it's ridiculous because as a counselor, I'm seeing the kind of cases. I had a case of a nine, ninth standard student uh, coming to me and saying, ma'am, I need your help. I said, yes, tell me. She said, how do I help my mother who's got four different fa uh, Facebook boyfriends? So I, I was stumped. I'm like, uh, I've been a counselor for a long time. This had never come to me. And I'm like, my dear, I need to think this through a little bit. And I thought, what do I tell a 14-year-old child in how she needs to help her mother? Can you see something is going terribly wrong in our world, the primary nurturing relationship is one the mother would have with the child. So say 20 odd years ago, about 25 years ago, when I used to be a counselor in many of the schools and colleges of Delhi, children used to come to me with issues or problems or even the adults. It was usually to do with a strong authoritarian male who would not give them freedom or it would be bullying by an elder brother or a cousin. You know, these were the issues or they wanted to have career counseling to understand. 20 years later, after I finished my corporate career, I came back and went back into the same schools as a counselor. After one and a half years, I quit in depression. This is what I found. This is data of Delhi, but I correlated this with some of the other big cities in the country. Okay, and I hope this is not the case in some of your countries. This is what I found. <cling> in 20, 20 odd years, with the advent, what was a big change in the last 20 years? Internet, media, cable television, OTT, all of these things, which suddenly begin to bring in all kinds of conflicting messages and values into your homes, into your smartphones and so on. So people begin to get influenced and they begin to get lost. So the big change I saw was the children coming to me now between the sixth and the 12th standard. So this is between the age of say 12 to 18. And this subset is all girls. I, I was in a girls school at that point. I saw that... Um, 70% of them had attempted suicide at least once or had major eating disorders. They were starving themselves or they were bulimic. Um, some of them were in very, very dark chat rooms because they used to feel so disconnected from their homes, their environments, their family. They didn't know who to turn to. And of course, then they used to get misappropriated in so many ways. And most disturbing, when I went deeper into my analysis, I found this was because 90% of those children reported that their primary relationship with their mother had broken down. This was not the case 20 years ago. Why I'm saying that, I'm not saying all the responsibilities with the woman or the mother, but understand this, nurturing relationships, whether it's the mother or the father, is what shapes a healthy and whole individual. We may have received it, we may not have received it, may, we may have received it in decrease. However, when you become parents, influencers, mentors to the youth, understand that you are in a position to influence positive or negative change. And if your parents, for example, understand this always, children don't learn from what you say, they learn from what you do. So your own behavior, your own actions, you can't shout at a child and say, you should be polite. Doesn't add up. The energy is not one of politeness. And children begin to think, yeah, like she shouts at me and she's asking me to be polite or he shouts. It doesn't work like that. So this is another very, very, as potential parents, we have the greatest responsibility. I always say this, Hitler as a baby was as innocent as anybody else. What made him become who he became? And so on. So you have both sides, what made a Nelson Mandela or what made a Mahatma Gandhi or what made a Hitler or what made other sort of, you know, um, autocrats throughout history. 
study human psychology and behavior, read books about leaders, both sides of the spectrum, and you'll begin to understand how the human mind works, how human emotions influence things. And if you crack the human code, you have cracked how to deal with the human experience on this planet. Which is why, once again, do not forget the human in all of this. I saw two hands raised. One is, um, uh, go ahead, Reshmi. And I saw one more hand, which seems to have gone down. Over to you, Reshmi. So if you are in a higher spiritual self, where you are uh, the one who absorbs and receives more energy of other people. And uh, so, you know, for example, you receded to depression because of uh, listening to the agonies of or the uh, darker state of other people, who do you turn to if you are in the higher spiritual self? Because, you know, it becomes very difficult to just then have a conversation, regular conversation to who do you go to? So one one uh, thing that I understand that you have associations, this um, small group that you shared. Uh, Rabate Salam, yeah. Rabate Salam. So maybe a group of people who comes together and I put the ball in your court to answer this all. Thank you. you. Thank you. Again, great question. So I will answer this in two ways. One is, yes, the associations of people, of other people of peace who can hold me in a space of no judgment when I'm feeling myself so confused and lost. And please understand this. None of us, unless we are great saints and masters, um, none of us are... Um, you know, we will not be above the confusions and the sufferings and the struggles as we move on this journey. That is a part of this human experience. And anybody who tells you, no, you are an expert now and therefore you will not have these challenges is plain and simple lying to you. The human experience is of this constant challenge. I look at it like this. I believe we are all spiritual beings choosing to have a human experience. And as beings, because there is a very strong spirit that we are all connected to, uh, and it's not limited or defined by any religion or you know, any of the smaller uh, sort of you know, uh, ramifications. It's a human experience. We are spiritual beings. We are constantly on a spiral of evolution. And my own humble understanding of this is we are all put in situations, which is like a test. And it's a little bit like when you're in a class, when you're in uh, you know, a lower KG or you're in a first or a second grade, you are in class and you have some teachers and guides who will come to you and then you're given simple mathematic problems like addition, subtraction and so on. And if you pass those lessons, you move up to the higher grades. And then later on, when you're in sixth and seventh in middle school, you will have your algebra and geometry. And therefore, you will have a new set of teachers or guides or mentors. And your problems become a little bit more complex. And then when you master it, you move up to the next grade. Our life is no different. We are all put into situations where there is an opportunity for learning and for growth. And if we see every challenge in our life as that, then the guides, the teachers, the lessons, the guidance, everything comes to us to help us to master that so that we move up to the next level till the next set of issues come our way, okay? This is the human evolution. So to the second part of your question, um, who do I go to? It was during this period I, uh, you know, apart from my own sort of struggles with what I was seeing in this modern society. And I, I remember writing an eight page long letter to the principal of this particular school saying, think about what you can do to a child because the issue was not just the parents. I would have for the first time, I would be listening to children saying, my teacher calls me stupid. She says, I'm dumb, I'm good for nothing. I have no future. And I'm thinking, this is my school. I went to and I'm who I am because of this school because when I was studying we were treated so differently we were told to believe in ourselves we were told it was an all-girls school it was a catholic school we were told the sky is the limit go conquer the world you know we were so 
I'm seeing that and I'm seeing this and I'm struggling, how do I reconcile? And then I realized obviously something has changed the minds of people over these last two decades. And we know what it is. This is what technology can do if we are not conscious of it. Anyway, so at that point, I went through this entire soul searching and this breakdown and so on and so forth. And um, that's when, uh, you know, they say, this is, I think, a quote from Buddha, if I remember correctly, who says, when the student is ready, the teacher will come. And uh, that's when my spiritual guide, I connected with my spiritual guide. Uh, uh, his name is Sri M. It's just the alphabet M. And it's interesting because very quickly, uh, he was born in the southern part of uh, India in a state called Kerala. Uh, his name of birth was Mumtaz Ali Khan. And at the age of 19, a series of events happened to him. He ran away to the Himalayas and then he met his teacher there and, um, you know, became a very high yogi uh, a practitioner of ancient sciences. And then uh, reach that stage which is called enlightenment or nirvana or self-realization and then was sent back by his uh, teacher his murshid to come back and to guide people and he was told specifically he's now in his 70s he was told specifically that you will have to live a regular life and get married and get a job because you're going to be guiding normal people like you and me about the challenges of life. So um, I went through two years of this constant, like this, this feeling really, really lost. And then his book came to me. And if you Google, there's enough information on him. He led a walk um, from uh, one end of India to the other, from Kanyakumari to Kashmir in 2015, called the Walk of Hope. So if you Google the Walk of Hope, you'll know. So anyway, the entry of a master like this is what then stabilized me on one level. And I began to understand by listening to him, by again, being in that field of peace, these great beings hold such a powerful space, such a powerful energy field. Uh, and he and his holiness, the Laila Lama, they're very close friends, that you know something in you begins to change and you begin to have a bigger understanding of life and existence. So yes, so... It was that and some of the other people who've been practitioners of peace who helped to support me through some of that. And they still do because I still go through these conflicts. You know, uh, there is enough of painful news that comes, you know, in these times, which can really hurt you, whether, you know, it's gender violence, whether it is uh, political, you know, sort of wars, all kinds of things. And who pays the price? It's always, you know, the innocent the regular people, the most uh, vulnerable and helpless. So those of us who have voices, it's important to use those voices, but use it after having fortified yourself from inside. Um, and there is enough. The good news about technology is you have access to books, you have access to talks, to videos, to podcasts. So go out there, listen to these, you know, Google the names of these inspirational people, and absorb and learn because we are energy beings when we listen to positive inspirational stuff that also becomes a part of us and then from there um, step out into the battlefield as agents of peace and light so thank you anybody else i know we are kind of going to run out of time very soon anybody else any other thoughts experiences questions any next steps any of you tell me a couple of you at least what do you plan to do after this course how are you going to go out feeling that something inside you has shifted not because of today's session but just this this entire course that you are doing uh, with in dialogue any thoughts around that i would love to hear more from you i'm actually going to go quiet and sip some water my throat is running dry so who would like to share Mm -hmm. Okay, so <clears throat> I'll take the initiative. Mm -hmm. uh, the earlier I raised my hand because I just wanted a small comment. Um, just like we were talking about self love. So for me, there is always two things self love and self work. If you just give you like extreme love, you cannot see your. Uh, like the disabilities kind of things or you will not work out on that and that is very important part of thing like 
uh, while enter into the society or enter into the, any kind of uh, field first you have to work a lot that that throughout the session we discuss a lot so for me always self love and the self work is like simultaneously simultaneously important so that was the i wanted to make a comment but now and no, uh, okay. can i just pause here my dear I'm this sure is so. actually very good because uh, when i use the term love it means accepting all of myself including my shortcomings and being responsible enough to do the inner work that i have to do love is not like a brainwashing saying oh i am perfect and i am good and i am better than everybody else we have enough of those narcissists in this world today okay you just have to go on to social media and you'll have all of those selfies no this is real love comes with a lot of responsibility and love is the energy of the divine love is the voice of truth so you cannot have love without truth and so my definition of love includes all of that but thank you for pointing out because love is such a bandied word exactly you know, because often we we miss miss confused with this uh, we should we should invent we should coin a new term for all the uh, creative minds here what can be a good substitute for the term love which talks includes responsibility and everything else uh, you don't have to tell me now but homework homework assignment and if you come up with some really and, good terms like and me. the love for me especially but i just uh, separate these two because we often over confuse with this but for me love comes with the care you care about the thing and if you care you will try to improve on that the shortcomings or the things on that absolutely and uh, uh, that's you know one of my my own personal philosophies in life is uh, leave everything better than when you find it whether it's yourself so when you find you know parts of yourself that you need to work on leave it better if it's a place you visit you know leave it better if it's a hotel room you stay in leave it better if it is a person or a relationship leave them better even if you have to leave so leave things better because you have entered into that space you know that's another way of growing and helping to heal things around us any other thank you so just this uh, talk that i heard long ago and it uh, mentioned about we were talking about self love so it talked about you know how we at a marriage we say for better or for worse to our partner or our spouse and why don't we say that to ourselves like you know i love we love like you go to yourself and say that hey i love you for better or for worse because it's very easy for you to love yourself when you are um, you are shining or you're doing well but it's on the low low days or when a bad hair day or just like when you're broke or when you've done some huge uh, thing which you consider is is incorrect you still have to love yourself for the worse and that's a promise that we all need to make to ourselves very very well put ragya and this is so true uh, this acceptance of you know i always i always think of the moon you know the moon has so many different phases right in nature there are cycles there are different seasons you know you will have the spring and the summer but you'll have the autumn and the winter why do we think we are different we also have our cycles we also have our seasons and we must accept all of that then we become complete and the essence of the spirit and the soul within us is actually complete and the great beings and masters who have touched that and have anchored themselves have come back and said that the innermost core of your state is absolute pure undiluted bliss it is ananda it is pure joy you don't have to do anything except remove the veils that keep it covered that is already who you are and the way to go there is by removing that which is the noise from outside and so yes love yourself care for yourself love others care for others do your inner work responsibly um they say the greatest service you can do in these times is your own inner healing 
you know, one healed soul has such a huge impact. One example I'll share with you quickly is this was in the 1980s when the Lebanon war was happening. Um, a group of meditators, this was again a scientific experiment. Um, <clears throat> A group of meditators were told, they were in different countries, 21, just 21 people were told at a particular time to connect into each other, hold a vision of peace in Lebanon and do this every day at a set time for 21 days. And so they would meditate together. They would hold this vision of peace that there is no war, there's no conflict. And they did this for 21 days. And after that, you know, it, they stopped because this was an experiment. And what they noted is on all the days when these 21 minds and hearts were joining and channeling peace energetically on one situation, those days, the conflict, the war, the cases of violence went down drastically. And then when this stopped, slowly it began to reemerge. So if 21 people in the state of, um, a state for this, this alignment is called coherence. Coherence. Usually we are in a state of incoherence when we are in conflict. But when we come into alignment, centeredness, coherence, just 21 hearts, working for a common purpose in that one-pointed way can create peace in a country, in a nation. Think of its implications. I'll once again remind you of how powerful you and I are, each of us. Don't let anybody else tell you otherwise. And when you reclaim that, you begin to experience that in your real life, then you will know what you need to do and how you need to go out into the world. So thank you, Akansha. Any other thoughts and comments from anybody else? Um, anyone from any of the other countries? Would you like to share anything? Is this making sense? Any thoughts, comments? Or have I put you all into a meditative state? Um, shall I share something? Oh, Sorry. Sure, sure. <laughs> Uh, first of all, thank you for this um, amazing, actually, session. Um, it was all from the heart and it touched my heart as well. Um, we are living in Iraq, actually, and it's obvious that Iraq is going through so many conflicts and we have so many crises. And there are so many diversity. Um, one thing to mention is that I participated in a um, three-day course um, about um, dialogue and the um, importance of dialogue in Iraq due to, due to those diversities. Uh, after ISIS war, um, the conflicts between um, Yazidis um, and Muslims um, increased and um, they were not like, they, they, they said that um, all Muslims are terrorists because ISIS killed our family. Um, they were not aware, aware of that. Um, most of the people that ISIS killed were Muslims as well. It's not about Muslim or any other background. They killed everyone. They hurted everyone. They raped, raped like Muslim girls as well and Yazidi girls as well, Christians as well. So um, um, there were some of the Yazidi people there in the course. They were not talking to us as Muslims. Um, my trainer told me that um, one of the most effective way to start dialogue is bringing food. Okay. So for the next day, I made a Kurdish food. Um, made a Kurdish sweet actually, and I brought it to the um, uh, to the course, and I served it to the Yazidis because there's a myth here that um, Muslims and Yazidis don't eat their each other's food because um, they, they think that Muslims believe that they are um, 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 they're they're like um, praising Shaitan, uh -huh, and we are you know. Uh, yes, but it's not true. Like it's all about the wrong knowledge that um, we yes. people are like you know receiving. We are not going and we are not following the right um, informations. So these conflicts, while you are seeing it, actually, what I did, I shared the suite by myself, and I told them that um, we are here, like we are family, like we are living together. And ISIS killed your family, for example, or other families. I am so sorry for it. They just needed that um, apology, actually, you know? 
I told them that we are so sorry for your loss, for your lose, loss. But how much your family got hurt, our families got hurt as well. So why don't we come and um, seek for the truth and make a group in order to work together to, to you know, um, to correct all those informations that till now are very wrong and everyone is believing it. Um, hopefully we are having group and we are sharing our thoughts and we are, um, you know, taking actions toward those, um, you know, education that till now we don't know what is the real education. We think that education is just like um, science and, you know, mathematics and being a doctor or being an, an, any other thing. But the real education comes when I accept you the way you are. This is how I see myself as an educated person. So like, you know, it was a very, at the, the first point, I was so um, upset about the, 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 the reactions that they had toward us. But unfortunately at the end of the course, um, so we could be friends and now we are talking and, you know, discussing ideas about things. So thank you. I mean, you know, this is so heartening and wonderful. This is, this is peace in action. This is conflict resolution in action. And she touched upon a few very important themes. One is, again, the importance of somebody reaching out, you know, because they know the other person is holding either pain or judgment and so on. So she had the courage to initiate that dialogue. Secondly, once again, we talked about this before, the importance of food. Food is at the heart of the human experience. We cannot undermine what it means to sit together and eat. Something changes. Food, I believe, carries some inner magic in it, you know. So how people connect over food. The third is she apologized for what they had to go through. This is what I meant, you know, when we hold the place for someone else's pain, they begin to heal. And so that helped them to shift from that place of feeling we've been through so much and no one really cares or understands to another space. Then what did she do? She said, let us change the misinformation. This is such a big one. So how can we counter the misinformation that is out there, which turns people against people? I see this all the time everywhere, including in my own country which goes back to, once again, the reminder of what Martin Luther King said, we have to organize better as people of peace. But we can only do that when we step out of our comfort zones, we are willing to reach out and listen to other people with genuinely an open heart to feel their pain and then try and see how we can help them. So thank you so much for sharing. This is a brilliant case study and should go onto a blog. So thank you. You or somebody else should write a blog about this and put it out there. And um, Bezad, please do send me the link. I would love to read this and similar Great. cases. Like this. Uh, Reshmi has a comment, and uh, if you Reshmi, if you just uh, unmute yourself and read it out. I've spoken so much. <laughs> I feel ashamed. There is no place for shame in this space of peace, the space of no, vibration of peace no, and shame. I, country, so. No, it's my philosophy to not, uh, you know, just because the space is empty doesn't mean that I have the access to it. I mean, I would like to leave it. So that, You have been given the permission by the moderator, so you have access yeah. to it. No, I just so, want to tell that uh, this is this excellent conversation between uh, Tina Thun and uh, Oprah Vimpre. And, you know, she asks him that, um, what is the time that you meditate? You know, what are the times when you think that you should sit and meditate? Mm -hmm. And he says that right now, while I'm speaking to you, I'm meditating. Okay. Oh, wow. And his, this conversation, I think all of you can just Google over YouTube. Oh, sorry, Google is the search uh, engine, but you can actually go to YouTube and just put this. So in this, the most important thing that has really touched me and that is in connection with the lecture that uh, you have shared today, ma'am, is that he talks about, so he says, you know, so she asked that how should one be listening to another when that person is sharing their pain? So he says that, you know, you cannot be this 
average listener. You cannot be just, okay, and then what next? Okay, not as a matter of fact, but he's saying that you have to engage in deep listening. And by deep listening, he's saying that, you know, you need to also be a little bit vulnerable to what you are listening to. So vulnerable towards yourself that as you are in the process of listening to that person, it might so happen that those words, those emotions, those expressions may touch certain things within you, which you never, you were in, you kept it in denial, you kept it under the carpet. So there might be a possibility and there are deep chances, you know, maximum chances that you will also sh uh, 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 ex uh, kind of uh, encounter some kind of transformation within you. So he says that deep listening is about just being present, being quiet, but at the same time, you are also engaging and empowering yourself to, uh, ex to, to experience change within you. So it is just not a monologue that you're listening to someone and you're not quiet, but he's saying that you, know, you are also changing and with that comes compassion. So he, he basically you know, explains this and this, is, this could be a, this could be a lecture in itself and by the way i see, see you as a peace dialogue speaker globally in the coming times reshmi so um you. you're forceful you're powerful and you bring it across with a lot of compassion and i see that other people here as well each of you will be given platforms to move out and and share these stories these are so powerful she touched upon this word vulnerability and i'm so glad you brought that up um, you know when we are in any uncomfortable situation with somebody especially when they're sharing their pain or their loss or their grief um, sometimes we feel so uncomfortable and the human mind can many times say oh I don't want to get into this because it's going to make me feel a lot of things which I don't want to feel. But the importance of being vulnerable is you open your heart out to truly listen to what they have to say, even if it triggers your own deep emotions about something similar. Or sometimes you empathize so much with them and their situation that for some time there is no boundary between them and you. You are just one human experience. It's this field in which transformation and change and healing happens. So thank you for sharing that, Reshmi. It takes a lot of courage to be vulnerable, a lot of courage to be vulnerable. And in these times, a lot of courage to keep your hearts open. It's so easy to just shut down and do what we need to do from a mind space. But that's not where the magic is. The magic is in this, in this space where you feel the pleasure, the joy, and the pain equally. Keep your hearts open. I'll quickly Anya. ask uh, Mona Lisa to talk about her PhD because she mentioned that her PhD is on food emotions. So if you could just quickly, yeah. um, uh, Mona Lisa, sum it up, and then I will uh, close the session after that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bagya. You're such a sweetheart. I love your haircut. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so um, first is um, I, I'm a foodie. We are, we are from Odessa, which is um, based out of tribal culture of food making. So the entire process of food making is spiritual. And uh, what we believe in also in our culture that uh, even smelling the food is fulfilling. So when, when as kids also, when we used to have um, any kind of, um, like we say, emotional eating, you know, we generally get depressed and eat emotionally. So how does that happen? So when we are working in the realms of uh, neurosciences and behavioral sciences, like ma'am actually was saying, and I was getting all hyped up to actually butt in, but I was driving. Um, but technically what happens is the uh, understanding of the process and how it impacts human beings, uh, because every six to seven weeks, we are changing our cells. All our cells are changing. And this happens because you renew it with the food that you eat. So basically, if you really want to change yourself, it is through the process of spiritual journey, the journey within you and through food. 
So that is something that I'm uh, going to be working on in my PhD, where we are going to be developing processes, which can be taken as a one, two, three toolkit, uh, which is going to be called uh, very commonly nowadays, we call it as emotional post eight. Just like the Band-Aid, when you get hurt, we know step one, wash it, step two, disinfect it, and then step three is put some Band-Aid. So something very similar to that, um, we are trying to, I'm trying to actually uh, get it a common knowledge as to how, because nowadays, like Ma'am was saying, um, we are becoming, instead of community, we are, we don't look at each other's eyes. We don't appreciate people because we feel uh, we feel that if we appreciate too much, maybe they think butter, amul butter laga rahe hai. <laughs> amul butter is costly. <laughs> so um, uh, what happens is when we are getting into a personalized space, which has become the relation between myself and my smartphone, in that realm, how do you yourself work within your limits? so that you can handle emotions in a proper way. And that can be done because even though we are personalized, we still have a relationship with the food. So uh, these are some thoughts that are coming up and this is uh, something that I've submitted um, to, to uh, work on. And this is going to be the first time which is going to happen in India because what generally I believe um, is all our things have taken out a lot of um, wisdom and these nuggets are taken to Harvard and MIT and then they are researched and, and grant are given and then it comes westernized to us and we are like yeah, jumping and that's a great thing that I have to take. Sorry, I'm very enthusiastic with what I do but I love doing that as all Thank of you, you know. So that is something that I'm working on and once I finalize it, uh, the premise um, I would be sharing, of course, in the group for their thoughts. We have a very beautiful and vibrant group. Um, and um, uh, everybody that uh, is there is so amazing, amazing. So thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Pragya, for giving me a chance to chit chat again. I love doing that. <laughs> thank, thank you, you Manalisa. Thank you. And uh, thank you, uh, Lakshmi, ma'am, for enlightening our students. Uh, indeed. Um, uh, I think which any peace builder will learn or will know is that uh, personal peace uh, is where the world peace starts. That's 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 the root of it. So uh, thank you for uh, training our children uh, or our students on on not children, sorry, uh, students on on this. And it's it's something I'm sure they will take back uh, with a lot of um, uh, remembrance. And I'm sure the way you taught it, they will um, imbibe it and internalize it. Thank you so much for being with us today again. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Pragya. Thanks to each of you um, for the spoken and the unspoken vibrations that you brought to, to this place. And just remember that the lighthouse is inside each of you. So go out there and be the light, okay? Thank you so much for this opportunity. Lots of love to everybody. I have left my uh, email ID in the chat box. So if anyone wants to stay connected, I look forward to hearing from you. Take care and have a wonderful rest of the day wherever you are. And continue to do the amazing work you are, your PhD thesis, your reaching out to people in pain and everything else. God Thank bless you. you. Allah bless you. May the universe bless you all. Thank you so much. Thank you.